it's lovely to be back and we thank God that you guys are back. We truly missed you. Without you, there's no North Rise. Let's pray together as we start our chapel this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for this beautiful day that you have made and that we can rejoice in it. We are glad that we can come together and worship you just as one family. We pray this morning that, Father, may you meet each one of us at our very point of need, even as we worship you, even as we look forward to seeing our friends coming back. We are just excited. But it's our prayer that, Holy Spirit, you'll be able to convict, encourage, and motivate us and to look forward to this semester. We pray for those of our friends that are still on their way, that, Lord, you hasten their steps, even as they come, that together we'll have fellowship. We pray all this with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Okay. Um, let me invite um, uh, Mr. Mlea to read us a psalm. Good morning, North Rise. Uh, our reading this morning is from Psalm 41, verse 1 to 11. And it reads, Blessed is he, one who consider the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord uh, delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give, you, pardon, uh, you do not give him up to the will of the enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sed, sick bed. In his illness, you will restore him to full health. As for me, I have said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say to me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad, a seven. All who hate, all who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me, verse eight. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where where he lies, verse 9, even my close friends, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me, verse 10. But you, O oh Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up, I may repay them, verse 11. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. Amen. Put my faith in Jesus. 
I met this young lady and I loved her so much. But I was moving from one town to another town. We just met within two weeks. I was moving into another town and I, it was hard for me because I loved her so much. I was finding it hard to sleep without thinking about her. Oh yeah, that is true. And after two weeks I shifted. I went to live in Mansa, Ropula province. And she remained on the copper belt. And I was thinking, these guys, they will take her away from me. <laughs> so I was praying, saying, Lord, protect her from vampires. These guys, I don't trust them. <laughs> I don't trust them. I loved her so much. 
She meant everything to me. And then, that time, there were no cellular phones, no social media, no internet. So the only means of communication was either by a phone, this land phone, and I didn't have that. And also, the other form of communication was by just letters, and it took 10 days to write a letter, to just have it in Mansa, 10 days. Letters moved by bus, and those of you remember, and it would take 10 days on a UBZ bus because transport was just terrible that time. And you can imagine I'm thinking about her, and I knew I would only read her letter after 10 days. So what I did, I wrote to her, I was writing to her every day. And she was writing to me every day. So that every day I would read something from her. That was the plan. And where I stayed, the distance was just a long distance. And I walked every day to go and get a letter from the post office. And I would open the post box, get a letter from there, and I would read it. The letter came from Mary. And I would read it just by, just immediately I got it from the box, I would open it and I would start reading it. Reading every word. And I was there smiling and I was happy about it. Because that letter came from someone I loved. I would walk about 30 meters, I would read the letter again. <laughs> I would go somewhere where I was alone, I would read the letter. It didn't matter to me how many times I read that letter because that letter came from somebody I loved. I would go home in the night, I would wake up, lit the candle, and read that letter again. And I kept that letter under my pillow. And I remember how I wrote, by the way, I still have those letters with me. I've kept them. I read them with my wife. She's my wife now, Mary. I would read that letter, I remember the language I would write to her, my sweet Mary, my pineapple, my watermelon, I love you so much. <laughs> that is what I did, and I've kept those letters. I'm counseling a young couple right now, and I'm going to read those letters to them. Oh yeah, and in the night, I would wake up, lit the candle, and I would read that letter. Tomorrow morning, I would rush to the post office to go and look for another letter from Mary. Do you know why I read that letter several times? It's because it came from someone I loved. If you love God, you read his word. <laughs> if you love him, it doesn't matter how many times you read this book. This is a love letter from someone who loves us. The same way I read those mails from Mary is the same way. Even much more I read this word because it is a love letter from someone who loves me and his name is Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give him a hand. <laughs> Let me share another story. Are you ready for another story? We looked forward to having you, first years. We looked forward to having you. We love you so much. And you are here not by accident, but at God's appointed time. I remember a preacher came to Ndola some years ago, a long time, and I was attending that crusade. It was a crusade. He was an American preacher. He came to preach in this city of Ndola almost 20 years ago. And I sat there listening to him, and he shared a story that touched my heart. And this story blesses me every time I think about it. It is a story that moved my heart, and my life was never the same when I heard the story. Are you ready to hear it? Yes. I hope it will bless you. He shared about a man who, who worked for the German railway company. This story happened just after the Second World War. And this man was a good worker, hard-working worker, and he worked for this railroad company. And every day he reported for work faithfully. And he was a married man, and he had only one son. And he loved that son so dearly. It was a small boy. 
when he knocks off, he would take his son and they would take a walk in the woods. In fact, they stayed near the mountains. He would take his son and they would move about. That was the only son he had. And he loved his son so dearly. And one day his son said, Dad, I want to accompany you to your place of work. His father said, no problem, my son. Let's go. But he cautioned him. Where I work, it is a dangerous place because there are a lot of machines there. And be careful. You'd get hurt if you're not careful. You listen? The son's name was Jack. Yes, Dad. Yes, Dad, I'll be careful. And they went there. And as he was waking, before he started waking, by the way, he took his son round, he took his son round, showing him the machines here and there. It was at a bridge where he went, near the rail line. And he told his son, be careful. Let me do something. Just remain here. And he went and started waking. And you know how children are. His son started moving up and down, going here and there, admiring the machines here and there. And then suddenly, because it was at the bridge, and that bridge was made in such a way that if cars are coming, then the man would press a button to stop, so, so, to give a signal to the train so that the train does not pass. It has to give chance to the cars. The technology had not advanced that time, the way it is today. So, and then he heard the train hooting coming from a distance, and he knew the train was coming. So he started calling for his son. Jack, where are you? Because he knew that if he goes out looking for his son, the train might come and the vehicles might also come and there will be a disaster. He needed to attend to one thing at a time. And then his son could not respond and he was saying, Jack, where are you? Jack, where are you, Jack? Calling his son. And there were big machines there, dangerous machines, wheels and turbines and everything was there. And his father got worried, but he needed to work. He needed to work. Now he was thinking, if I go out looking for my son, the train and the cars, the vehicles might crash and lives will be lost, many lives. What do I do? He needed to make a decision, either to go out and save his son or save the people. What would you do? This, is all, this was the only son he had and was thinking, he was stuck. Should I leave what I'm doing and go out and save my only son? Or I let my son die so that I save the rest of the people. He was confused. He didn't know what to do. And the train was coming. The train was coming. Then he made a decision. How many people want to know the decision he made? He made a decision, he said, oh, I don't know what happens, but I must save the people. The train came. <laughs> and that is what he did. The train came and just passed the bridge, and the vehicles were also safe. The train was safe, and the people on the train were safe, and the people driving the cars were also safe. And after that, he saw the train passing. He went inside now to look for his son. Jack, where are you? Jack, hoping he will find his son. And then suddenly he just saw a piece of cloth fall down. It was stained in blood. And he knew what had happened. He was thinking, I hope what I'm thinking is not exactly what has happened. And then suddenly he saw a piece of flesh. In fact, it was a finger. Before he could imagine, another finger. And he knew that was his son. He knew what had happened to his son. And he was crying with tears in his eyes. And then he started seeing a lot of flesh coming, just falling down from those machines. And he knew his son had died. He just picked the pieces of flesh from the remains of his son, took off his his coat and just put the pieces in there and he was just blood was oh, 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 blood was all over his body and he was crying and his son was no more he went out and he saw the train going and there were a lot of people on that train some were drinking others were smoking others were playing cards but none of them on 
None of those people on the train knew what had happened. They didn't know the sacrifice that had been made for them to be saved. Someone had sacrificed his son in order to save the people on the train. But no one on the train knew what had happened. And this man was crying. He looked at the remains of his son. His son was no more. And people on the, plane, on the train were so excited, happy, going to their destination. Beloved, that is exactly what God did 2,000 years ago. He let his son Jesus die because of you and me. He sacrificed his only son so that you and me could have life. You see. The world does not know the sacrifice that God did in order to save us. We are not concerned. We are like men and women on that train. May God open our eyes to see, for us to see that sacrifice and accept the gift of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Galatians chapter number 4, verses 1 to 7. Galatians chapter number 1, chapter 4, sorry, verses 1 to 7. Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7. The word reads, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no better than a slave, though he is the owner of all the estate, but is under guardians and trustees until the dead set by the father. So with us, so with us, when we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the time, the right time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. May God bless the reading of his word. This is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians. He's writing this letter while he's in prison. He's a prisoner. But he's writing a letter to encourage the church in Ephesus. And he gives an illustration of a child. Saying a child, though he has an estate waiting for him, he lives like a slave because he doesn't know, he doesn't understand his rights. He doesn't understand his rights. So this is a picture of a small child who is the heir of a big estate. And as long as he's a child, he's essentially no different from a slave in the eyes of the law because he cannot make decisions. He has no freedom. He's subject to what his guardians and trustees say until he reaches the age in which his father decides that he can now on the estate. And Paul is using this picture of our condition before Christ came in our lives. Before Christ came to earth, we were bound. Before Christ came, we were slaves. Slaves to the law and slaves to sin. But we are told that at the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem us. To redeem us from the case of the law. Now, God has provided us, all of us in here, especially, even, especially the first years, this is an opportunity for you to grow. God provides all of us an opportunity to grow. And coming to North Rise University is an opportunity God has provided to you so that you grow from where you are to another level, where you grow in your relationship with God. He does not want you to remain a child. So from secondary school, you are now in the university. That is growth. It's a growth process. From the university, you go to another level. But a lot of people do not seize this opportunity, do not seize an opportunity for growth. 
They want to remain in the same place. They want to remain bound. They want to remain static in their lives. So at the right time, God brings you to an authorized university so that you grow and become what God intended for you to become. Now, when Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he tells them at the right time, God sent his son. What does he mean when he says at the right time? That time, the world had evolved. There was a lot of change. We call it the Pax Romania, meaning the Roman peace. The world enjoyed some form of peace because Rome was very organized and Rome was the superpower. So there was peace and also the road network was favorable within the Roman Empire. People could move from one place to another because of what Rome had put in place. And also the language. Today we are using English as, a, as the language of communication. Maybe I would say three quarters of the world uses English, but that time it was Greek, Koine Greek. They used Greek, so because of Rome, the Koine Greek was the language that the Roman Empire used to used for communication. So it became the right time because of the road network, right time because of the language. It was easy for God to send his son now because people could understand the gospel through this language which was Greek. So we are told that at the right time, God sent his son. The question is, why did God send his son? Why did Jesus Christ come? God sent his son to buy us freedom, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to sin and slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us in his own family. That is the reason God sent his son, so that he could redeem us the word redeem simply means buying back. You and me were slaves on the slave market of sin, but God sent his son and his son came on the slave market where we were bound in chains of sin. His son came and cut those chains when he died on the cross and shed his blood. And that blood is meant for our redemption so that you and me could become the children of God. So he sent his son to buy freedom for us as we are slaves to sin so that he could adopt us into his own family as his children. God intervened in history and changed our relationship with him. Before Jesus died on the cross, there was a war of hostility that existed between mankind and God. There was enmity between man and God. But Jesus came and brought down the walls of hostility so that so much so that you and me, once we are washed in the blood of Jesus, can go in his very presence as children of God. We can go in his presence and cry, Abba, Father, because he's now our father. Our relationship has been changed because at the right time, God sent his son. So Jesus came to buy us out of this slavery. The other thing that Paul talks about is that when Jesus had bought us from this slavery, he also adopted us, meaning he moved us into his family. He adopted us. He redeemed us from slavery, but he did not just leave us there. He now adopted us into his family. And being in the family of God, we enjoy all his rights, the rights of being his children. Romans 8 verse 17 says, we are heirs of God and heirs with Christ. So we have this privilege of enjoying the rights as children of God. This is why Christ came to redeem us and to adopt us into his family. Further, Paul says, 
and we have received the spirit of sonship and we can cry, Abba, wonderful. You imagine, this gift was withheld from us, the gift of his spirit. But because Jesus died, we have access now to go in his very presence and we can also enjoy the benefits of being children of God. And we are told he has also given us the gift of his spirit. The spirit of God is a gift which God gives to his children and we can cry, Abba, Father. It is not a cry of anguish. It is a cry of sonship that God is my very father. The creator of the universe, the God who loves me, is my father. I can go in his presence without fear. I can go there knowing he's my father who loves me. And Jesus is my brother. Praise the Lord. I love this Jesus because he first loved me. Ah. <laughs> Sister Caroline, you remember that song we sang in Sunday school? <laughs> yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you believe he loves you? Yes, yes Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. <laughs> yes, Jesus loves me. And I know he loves me. He died for me. Did you know that if the world had only one person, and if that person happened to be you, Jesus would have still come to die for you. That is how much he loves you. Jesus loves you. I want to invite you this morning to the family of God. Maybe you've never had an opportunity to say, Jesus, here I am. Forgive my sins. I surrender my life to you. If you've never had that opportunity, I want to invite you to the table of God. To this table where Jesus is seated and he's saying, come, my son. Come, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this opportunity that we can listen to your word and that, Lord, we can become your children if we put our trust in you. I thank you for this wonderful family here at North Rise. I thank you, Lord, for our students, the festers and returning students, members of staff, the faculty and staff, each one of us, Lord, we are in your hands. I pray, Father, that, Lord, you speak to someone who has never trusted in you, who has never put their faith in you. Speak to them and invite them to yourself. Let them surrender their life to you so that they will become your child. And at the end of it all, they will live with you for eternity. As our heads are bowed down, I want to ask those who are saying, Jesus, forgive my sins. I want you to be my savior. If you are here, you can just indicate by raising your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you for those hands. Do we have someone? Thank you for that. Thank you for those hands. Do we have some more? Thank you for those hands. Someone else? Thank you for that end. Thank you. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters whose hands have been raised. I pray, the Lord, that you accept the sacrifice from their heart, the sacrifice of just surrendering their lives to you. Write their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I will invite those who raise their hands to come to my office on the first floor. If you don't know where my office is, just ask anyone, chaplain's office, come there. I have a small Bible for you, which I want you to read. It will be your own Bible. I'll give it to you. So please, if you raise your hand, see me after chapel, come to my office. I want to have a word with you and just bless you with a small Bible. God richly bless you. Thank you, Mrs. Mutono. God bless you. Thank you.
Thank you, Pastor, for um, the message. Um, I'd like us to sing that song. Jesus loves me, this I know. Yes. For the Bible tells me so. Me to one. Because you are God, and you're worthy of praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 